All right. Well, good day, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this webinar. Uh, first webinar of 2023 uh, with uh, co-editors uh, Jennifer Lee and Melody Robinson from the Journal of Management Education. Uh, welcome, everyone. So some of you or most of you know me. Uh, my name is Alex Bignotti. I'm a senior lecturer at the Department of Business Management at the University of Pretoria. And I am uh, really passionate about social entrepreneurship. And that's what I read about uh, daily or weekly <laughs> when it's a busy week and I like to uh, write about. And I'm currently the director of ANSYS, the African Network of Social Entrepreneurship Scholars. As some of you know, this network was um, started in 2018-19, let's say. Uh, it was um, was part of the a project for which we got funding from, from Belgium and with all the activities that we ran, a network started emerging, which is currently ANSYS. Uh, today we have about 150 members across Africa and the rest of the world. Um, those from the rest of the world are people who uh, do work in Africa, if they're not African themselves. And um, yeah, we are making headway. I'm so pleased that we can start the year with such a wonderful um, event as this webinar. And just to give you some good news, um, so we could, the the Queen of Belgium is on her way to make a royal visit to the to South Africa, and because there was funding from Belgium and the visit is about social entrepreneurship, we are trying our utmost best to get her to uh, run her activities at the University of Pretoria. So hopefully, I'll be part of some round tables, um, but I'm tr trying to figure out if an audience will be allowed, in which case I'll let you all know. And please join answers, but I can give you more information at, at the end of this webinar. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our co-editors from the Journal of Management Education. Uh, first up, Jennifer Lee. She's Professor of Management at Nazareth University in Rochester, New York. Um, over the past 15 years, she has had editorial roles in different uh, journals, currently at the Journal of Man Management Education, and she has been honored for her teaching and learning innovations by the MED Division of the Academy of Management in 2021, the QS Reimagine Education Gold Award, and the MOBTS uh, Lost in Impact Award in 2020. Um, and then welcome, uh, Jennifer. And then uh, Melanie Robinson, uh, she is Associate Professor at the Department of Management at HSC Montreal. And she has an interest in leadership and management education. And within the latter, she's particularly interested in experiential learning and the development of instructional instructional innovations. So once again, welcome to our guests or main presenters for the day who will take us through uh, the Journal of Management Education and the process of publishing and many other topics. So uh, before I hand it over to them, uh, please feel free to turn on your camera and, and look more familiar and, and cozy and also to um, pop any, write down any questions and comments in, in the chat. I will keep an eye on those. Uh, and when we reach the Q&A session, we will take from those. So thank you for your attention and I hand it over to Jennifer and Melanie. Thank you again for having us today. We're really happy to be part of this dynamic group and to get out on virtual roadshows. Uh, we appreciate uh, your time. We'll, we'll spend some time. Um, you've had our introductions, uh, so uh, thank you for that. We wanted to uh, begin um, with understanding some of the main topics you hope for us to cover today. So I went through the registration uh, spreadsheet that Alex shared with us to understand what people were we're interested in. And so I'll summarize from there. And if there's other things, um, I really encourage people to, to pop those in the chat and we can, uh, we can hear some more from people. What I saw in the spreadsheet is that people want to understand um, how to publish in our particular journal. 
but also more broadly the publishing process. So what are the steps and stages? Um, there were some uh, questions about types of topics and how social entrepreneurship topics would fit in the journal. Those are all things we'll cover. Uh, other things that I saw in the list that aren't in our purview, uh, but we can spend a little time providing comments. There were questions about how to write grants and funding. That's something that um, I do not have expertise in. And so um, we definitely refer you to, to other kinds of workshops. Uh, and there uh, were some other questions about uh, that were related to scholarship of discovery research. Uh, more social entrepreneurship as its own phenomenon, not as related to education. We're really scoping our talk today to think about publishing um, social entrepreneurship, social impact, social innovation research within the context of management education journals, um, as well as other um, potential outlets. And we hope to learn from you as well. So those were some of the topics that I saw that you wanted and um, some of the ones that you wanted but were not able to speak on. Are there other things uh, that people would like to know about the journal or publishing that I didn't state? If you can throw those in the chat, we would appreciate it. And while those are, are popping through, um, maybe we'll spend a few minutes going through publishing social entrepreneurship, uh, teaching and learning research, and then We'll circle back to make sure um, we've covered those or um, pull into other slides to address the topics. Is that a good plan, Melanie? That sounds good. Great. Hi, everyone who just joined us. We're very excited to meet with you today. So one of the things Melanie and I did is we spent some time looking at our journal and the areas in which we have published in uh, topics related to social entrepreneurship. So I frame this as a person who teaches a, a social entrepreneurship class. We call it Changemaker Leadership at my institution. Um, how to link the journal and what we've done in the past to social impact, the sustainable development goals, and uh, and our, um, our canon. So if we look back uh, for the past decade and a half, we've covered a number of special issues that relate to social impact. We um, started going back in uh, 2008 is the uh, first uh, special issue in management education on poverty. And uh, then uh, we've had a couple issues on sustainability in 2000 nine as well as most recently in 2020. We've had uh, a number of topics about diversity education uh, that includes uh, women's leadership and more recently our uh, most recent special issue on privilege and management education. Um, we've covered indigenous knowledge as well as PRIME itself. I think some of you are at institutions that are signatories of the PRIME principles and uh, finally, uh, in the middle of pandemic, we published on uh, health topic, mental health, and uh, we've also had thematic issues about health. So we know that the social entrepreneurship uh, umbrella uh, covers a lot of different domains, and we wanted to just profile for everyone the, the large set of resources that we have that we think might be relevant and useful for you in your classrooms already, in addition to thinking about how you might want to position some of the work and pieces that you are interested in writing up for management education. We did our own uh, search to, to see some of our, um, our own results. So I'll start with the, the right hand column. So if you just put in social entrepreneur with the wild card, we had about 238 results. That's just uh, across all the literature. And if you get into abstracts using that terminology, it's it's a, a little um, smaller and more specific. Uh, but as you can see from the special issue topics, we're talking about what I think are fundamental social impact and social entrepreneurship concepts. And then in the, the exact title, social entrepreneur, even smaller. So um, 
we think that we have the topics there, but I also wanted to just demonstrate that we're, you know, we are publishing and we're interested in publishing in this area. I think, you know, for, for you all, um, one of the, the challenges and the opportunities is that this, this domain covers a lot of disciplinary boundaries, right? We can think about social entrepreneurship, social innovation within the health context, right? And that's gonna pull us into different literatures that we can think about it in the entrepreneurship. That was a question someone had, like, are we interested in entrepreneurship education? Yes, we're interested in that. Um, you know, we know that um, people are having conversations about social impact and innovation and political science and sociology and public administration, right? There's a lot of places that you all can go, but we do want you to know that you can you can come to us in management, particularly if you're teaching management students uh, or public administration students in management core courses. And just to elaborate a, a little bit more, uh, we wanted to profile our Roethlisberger winner in 2018 was a, a social entrepreneurship piece. Again, this might be of interest for people to read, but also to look as a, a template. And so uh, this is our annual award uh, that is given to the article that's chosen by uh, a community. It's a big committee from our Management and Organizational Behavior Teaching Society. Uh, so this again is to underscore our, our interest and in our care as a journal and as a society for this topic. Um, when thinking about particular uh, areas that you might think about and that would align with what we're interested in, um, you could think about questions like, how do you teach core concepts like social innovation, base of the pyramid, new business models and forms, which is interesting for us, but when I teach it to my students, they find structured topics a little dry, even if it's social entrepreneurship structures and models. What do, what do we need to do to help students uh, be good collaborators as change makers or work in tri-sector partnerships? There's lots of room and space for uh, research and contribution uh, for innovations as well as conceptual pieces for teaching. We'll break down these different categories um, for what it means in our journal and what those look like. Um, Melanie, is she has a specific interest and we both share this, is to develop um, particular innovations that are experiential exercises that help you um, in the classroom engage students in active participatory learning. And we know that there's a lot of innovation happening uh, in your region. I came to South Africa about eight years ago when the Academy of Management was um, held in South Africa and I was talking to educators and I just think that there were a lot of great things happening. It's just that I know because of the workload, people have constraints in actually writing things up. And Melanie and I have some ideas to support folks on that. Another area of uh, potential topics that would be of interest to us would be debates within the field. Um, so are there conversations that are happening about, you know, is social entrepreneurship distinct or uh, embedded within entrepreneurship? Um, how, do, how does teaching this contest our business as usual uh, business models or other fundamental assumptions? Those are great topics for essays, which is a particular section of our journal. So um, in this slide and then the next slide that Melanie will go to, I'm trying to highlight within sort of our, uh, our sections as well as our general questions, the ways that you can tailor this to your particular area. This list of questions here is our general list of questions, but I've added in dimensions that relate to, to social impact and social entrepreneurship to help kind of spur in your minds, like oh, there's a connection for me, or oh, I have something to say about that. Uh, and, and you know, we want to encourage people, we'd love for you to write about social entrepreneurship, but you're also welcome to submit on anything that has to do with management, teaching, and learning as well. And so I'll go through some of these and, and elaborate. JME is really interested in what happens inside the classroom and the learning experience in the classroom we now know is not just like four walls, but it's virtual and it's asynchronous and it has all these dimensions. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier, we're interested in 
different types of classroom practices, activities, and even instructor development that could enhance learning effectiveness related to social entrepreneurship concepts. Most people don't get, get training right in social entrepreneurship, um, at least until more recently, and they don't also get training in teaching and learning. So you have this interesting, you know, uh, cross section of what do we need to be able to deliver both content as well as the process of learning. Um, what are current educational assumptions and practices that should be questioned and challenged in the context of the current climate emergency and increasing inequalities? I think that you know, social entrepreneurship sits right at the center of these conversations, and many of you would likely have some things to say about this, likely in an essay format. Um, how do we know what is effective practices in uh, management education today globally? So some of the models that perhaps are used here in North America, what are some, um, what are some adjustments that might need to be made in other contexts? Uh, what are connections between what we do as educators and what our students actually learn? Uh, what should be taught related to the sustainable development goals and different levels, undergraduate, graduate, postgrad, or executive in terms of preparing the next, uh, the next generation of managers and leaders? And uh, what should we be um, as uh, instructors learning, right? How do we do our own professional development to uh, to help our students face, you know, given this, all these major challenges that we're facing. And uh, how might our educational systems be delivered um, differently or redesigned? We know that there's an issue of scale in many parts of the world and teaching, you know, how do you teach more people quickly because we need more people with these skill sets in order to, to manage these challenges? So this is just a, a sort of starter set of questions. Go ahead, Melanie. Um, and you know what we'd like for for people to do is that is to take a step back and think, okay, what is my intent? So if you have some general ideas, um, first you need to make a decision. Am I interested in contributing to the scholarship of teaching and learning and how we uh, teach social entrepreneurship, or is your contribution more about the field of social entrepreneurship itself? And both of these are really important and needed. And um, if you, you know, and, and they can be interconnected, right? So what you study and learn um, out in the field about how um, social entrepreneurship is unfolding in different regions, that can still inform uh, practices in the classroom. But we're really interested in what's happening in the teaching and learning process. So once you make that decision about teaching and learning, then you want to think, am I interested in, you know, a classroom process or am I interested in broader, more macro topics like policies about entrepreneurship funding in the country? And should that include social entrepreneurship um, uh, accreditation, um, those kinds of issues that happen at the, the national level or regional level? Those are topics that are important, but they're outside the scope of our journal. And so one of the things um, not to be totally uh, focused on our journal. I want to give you information about what we're looking for, but also a way of thinking about where to place and how to place your papers that was of interest to people. And so your intention um, kind of drives everything else. So if you intend to contribute to the scholarship of teaching and learning and management, then you'll want to get into that, um, that canon, which is why I sort of showed the, the materials from our journal and there's materials from AMLI, Academy of Management, Learning and Education. There's materials um, from, from many other journals that we would wanna see you pull into the, your piece that you're writing to speak to this, the specific conversation that you're having uh, and wanna join. So I'll pause here and see if anything else came up in the, in the chat before I press on with other comments. Are there any other key points for me to emphasize from the chat? Not, not yet, uh, but a question comes to mind to, to me as I'm listening to you. So I don't know if people have a, an opportunity in this webinar, but I'm wondering how, how would one position a paper that's more about the 
the pedagogy or the approaches of teaching rather than uh, what we are more used to, which are papers that are have a theoretical foundation and then they make contribution to theory. So how, yeah, how are those papers positioned? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe just to mix things up, Melanie, do you want to hop in and provide some comments? Uh, not at the moment. I think we do have some slides, though, that present the different sections of the journal that will be coming up in a moment. So I think that might help a little bit with that question. Um, if we're OK, just waiting one or two minutes for it to. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I will say just briefly, um, you know, we there's many things that are quite similar to a traditional journal article that we expect um, in the scholarship of teaching and learning. And actually, one of the kind of mistakes that people make is thinking that it's it's something very different and not doing a literature review uh, in an appropriate kind of way uh, that people present their ideas like I did this great thing. I'm describing it to you. It's amazing. And we think that's wonderful enthusiasm, but that needs to be uh, set in the field um, specifically. And we have different sections where you set things um, in, a, in a particular way. OK, so we press on uh, so we can get to the discussion time. Um, so as I was stating earlier, you want to explore what you already um, what's already known in the field. So don't just describe your innovation, right? You want to um, you want to see what's known about the particular topic, right? What's happening in social entrepreneurship education in particular, and then the sub conversations within that. And, and often, you know, it's going to be starting with the journals that you're reading regularly and the, the articles that you're really enthusiastic about. Uh, so, you know, think about what are the journals and social entrepreneurship field and what types of work do they publish? Are there people publishing pedagogy there that might be, you know, a, a more preferable outlet? Um, what are the related disciplines publishing? I went through a number of those that I see as intersecting with your area. Um, uh, what are the important topics um, that are happening in higher education. So there's kind of layers in uh, in in management ed, or not management education in, in pedagogy journals where things can go and it really positioning makes a difference uh, where those things are going. Or um, are you interested in practitioner outlets like uh, training and development for people in the field as opposed to higher education. So again, asking yourself these questions. Um, and then, you know, what, what are the gaps uh, and uh, what, what are you addressing through your contribution, your innovation, your new idea, your research study related to social entrepreneurship, whatever that is. We want you to kind of preemptively be on top of the, the question that all our reviewers have, which is like, what, what, what's new here? So you, you do that by telling us and by um, showing us um, what's present and what's absent in the literature. Uh, we also encourage people to think about, even though we would love for you to send your stuff to us, like you will have preferences of where you want to publish, but you might have prescribed publishing outlets, like you need to be on a certain rank or certain, um, uh, you know, a certain, uh, subdomain, there may be priorities for people in your department. Um, is publishing an open access uh, an important value for you? Uh, that's, um, or is there funding that you have access for, for open access publishing? These are important questions. Uh, and again, who do you want to speak to? Who's your audience? Practitioners read different things than academics. Uh, policymakers read different things than us academics, senior academics um, are interested in different topics or might not know about the topics that you're bringing up as uh, as early career researchers uh, and and so on. So who who is the audience you want to connect with? Our audience is higher education management uh, and leadership educators. Um, I think public administration people tend to read our some of our work, and it's really uh, a higher ed context. So who you know who's the people that you want to speak to? 
I think this uh, is one of the slides Emily, <laughs> Melanie was referring to. Sorry, I'm still not fully caffeinated. Um, for us, we want uh, in our articles evidence-based assertions. And so when you're making claims about what is and isn't happening, um, we want you to show us that through the, through the literature review. And again, it's not just the world according to your experience. Um, and when you're thinking about the data, we're very open um, in our journal, but looking what the, what the journal's expectations are. Uh, you know, do they just want quantitative studies or do they just publish quantitative studies? Is qualitative res research acceptable? Um, are there methodologies that are more common or not? For us, um, self-reports kind of have limited acceptance. We like to see things that there's a little more triangulation. Um, and uh, the student evaluation of teaching, that's what SET stands for. Um, there's, there's, they're limited and, um, and uh, challenging uh, depending upon the, the construction. Again, just to, to emphasize two points, um, what's the kind of evidence you have access to and, um, or what might you plan ahead? So if you know that you're doing a particular exercise or innovation in your class, uh, is there other kinds of evidence that you can collect on your own? Um, and, and sometimes, you know, that takes, that takes time and, and planning. Uh, so, okay, Melanie, I think we can go to the next slide. We, we've done a tailored presentation. So we did more a generic or a, a specific to social entrepreneurship and then um, a broader view of the field. And now we wanna hone into some specifics of our particular journal. I think that um, hopefully I've been able to communicate that our focus is on experiential and active learning in management education. And we're really interested in articles that um, enhance student learning outcomes. And so it's not just, um, we're interested in new, in new ideas, but we're also interested in um, and things that actually have um, a basis that supports the student learning process. And that's the, the pieces that I was speaking about earlier for um, the types of evidence we're looking for. Okay, I see things going through the chat, but I'm not able to, to look at those in detail. Should we stop at this point and address a few? Yes, um, there were two questions. Uh, one is from Manisankar is asking how can we position the contextual findings in the paper? Suppose I'm doing the research on Indian social enterprises and the findings are different from what the literature says. Please advise. So, well, I think you, I guess, unless you want to jump in directly, Manisankar, uh, but my interpretation is what if my findings are unexpected or different from what has been uh, said so far? How do I put, uh, position a paper that is kind of like a contrasting or is rebutting what has been said so far? I'll start. I think that that's exciting, right? If you have evidence that that shows, you know, within um, within the Indian context, um, there's a, a a different insight, a different learning, or, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not sure fully, you know, it's hard to speak without knowing the research question, but but that's that's fine. We don't do replication studies. Um, that's not our, our kind of publishing. And I think that the key part is whatever the findings are, if they validate some parts of things that we, we know and extend by having new insights because of the context, then you write up the the discussion in a way that's going to help both Indian management educators, but also people in similar kinds of contexts. So there's some particular elements from an Indian context, or you know, um, a South African context, or uh, you know, a West African context, and those can be relatable in other parts of the world, right? There'll be parts that can relate to all management educators and, and kind of spelling that out for uh, for our readership. They'll be interested in that. Uh, and um, 
and we'll look for you to elaborate what are the implications for the teaching and learning practices with these different findings. I hope that gets at some of the, the questions. And that's what that's what the peer review process does, is it the reviewers help you hone in on that message and, and clarify it. So you'll have some of those insights, but by going through peer review, um, that also uh, gets teased out. Yes. Um, there are two other questions. They seem to be connected. One is, uh, would the journal accept a paper that it does a short review of entrepreneurship curricula? Um, okay, well, I'm reading as they have, have, have phrased, and I think in us kind of fixing that question, we can tell them precisely what we would accept or not. And does the journal uh, publish context specific reviews on social entrepreneurship? We so don't that, do, con yeah, we definitely don't do context specific reviews on social entrepreneurship. We would do, um, a, we would love a review paper on um, specific facets of social entrepreneurship education. Uh, there's not a, a lot of that, and that would be interesting to us. Uh, for us, it's the education dimension is always paired with our work. Okay. Yeah, and the other question, unless Doreen wants to jump in, turn on the mic and tell us more. Uh, but I understand it is kind of a re maybe a desktop review of the entrepreneurship curriculum, which means that the empirical part of the paper would do would be, you know, kind of mapping um, different curricula and how they I mean, th that's my interpretation of the question. Would that be uh, something that would be of interest or how how would one bring that initial intention to a paper that is more worthy of publication? Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple thoughts, and again, uh, Melanie, feel free to to jump in if I miss pieces. What I would say is is potentially um, for us, you know, it's not just the review itself and being descriptive, but then you know, collating some insights for. Um, what are what are some research questions this brings about right, as a result of this review? What are some practical implications um, in terms of uh, different lenses you can you can put on practical implications for program managers or for uh, for for faculty? This is at the curricular level, but one of the great ways to to sort out like a, a paper scope, you can always email an abstract to Melanie and I to take a look. And we also have editor's office hours where you can come specifically and have a more, um, you know, informal conversation like you would have at a at a workshop or a conference where you can just talk to editors, you know, in the hall over coffee. So that's the editor's office hours. Oh, wonderful. I didn't know that existed. Hmm. OK, um, a question from Dr. Filet. Uh, dear Jennifer and Melanie, I don't teach but run a business incubator where we support entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs through a range of interventions and mentorship. I would like to write about our experience and impact. Will it be possible to publish it in your journal? Thank you, Puppet. Is the incubator associated with higher education? I guess that would be my question. Or is it a standalone nonprofit mm -hmm. entity? Um, it is. It is um, within. Uh, it's at Durban University of Technology. Um, the incubator is based at Durban University of Technology, but we are funded by government, the Small Enterprise Development Agency. So we we actually. Um, it's almost as a, as a standalone in a way, but within the university. So we support alumni, not really students at this point, because there is another entity that supports um, entrepreneurship for students. But we support alumni and we support local community businesses or SMEs as we call them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, it's tricky 
um, oh. because there's this space that's kind of on the edge. You're affiliated with higher education, but it's uh, it's more like work workforce development, um, community based training. I think that uh, is that correct. Uh, no, no, no. We don't do training at all. Ours is actually so it's really a, 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 a suite of services pro that we provide uh, as well as as well as mentorship that actually develops it's more hands-on more practical and uh, we do run workshops once a month maybe but um, our most of our work is hands-on kind of development and growth of the businesses tracking and growing those businesses yeah my inclination is that's more that would be more suited for a training and development style journal and again melanie do you want to hop in on this conversation i i was going to present the same advice that i think it fits a little bit less maybe with jamie per se but it's a very interesting program that absolutely be very interesting to bring to the conversation related to um teaching social entrepreneurship, just perhaps not a JME focus because it's less in the classroom for that. Yeah. I would well, say other that. outlet, oh, sorry. No, I said thank you very much for that. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, depending upon the aspects, like you might want to look at management learning that is a much broader umbrella about working with managers. And I think it sounds quite interesting what you're doing. So I would look into their journal as well as a potential outlet. Um, and they have a really reflective practice approach. Okay. No, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, um, Melanie and Jennifer. I appreciate your comments there. Thank you. This might be a wonderful time to segue into some of our sections of the journal. If um, if time permits, just to kind of explain a little bit of the different ways that the sections are framed. And this will allow you to imagine how you could take your paper or paper idea and write it in, in line with one of those sections. So we have just a couple of slides and then we'll have lots of, of time for questions as well. As Jennifer mentioned earlier, some of the key questions are, what does this bring to the discussion in management education? So more formally, our guiding questions um, related to JME are, will this contribution have significant impact on thinking and practice in management education specifically? And how will it help our readers think innovatively about management education? And there's a lot of ways to do that. So the different example questions that Jennifer had presented earlier related to social entrepreneurship that relate to our mission are really interesting to look at because they can be tackled from many different angles. It could be an empirical research project that allows you to extend what we know related to management education and social entrepreneurship. It could be presenting a new pedagogical innovation that you've created for your classroom. It could be through a first person reflective essay based on issues that you've observed that exist and that you want to elaborate on and contribute with recommend recommendations and suggestions. So one of the things that I love the most about JME is that we have all these different sections and all these different ways to position our reflections and contributions to the management education conversation. So we'll start with instructional innovations. Jennifer mentioned earlier that I do love them. It's true, and I know Jennifer loves them as well. These are those pedagogical innovations that we create for our classrooms and programs that are very active in nature. So they're really based on experiential learning. And it's more of describing them and presenting what we've done and evidence of their effectiveness so that other people can be inspired to use them in their context as well, in their classrooms. So those exercises are always grounded really in the literature at the outset of what are the key concepts that are being mobilized within the innovations. And importantly for the Journal of Management Education, they include evidence of effectiveness. So more than just self-report perceptions of how much we enjoyed the exercise from the student's perspective, um, really evidence of learning. Now that's not always easy to collect depending on different exercises. And we do have another journal that's uh, 
part of the Management and Organizational Behavior Teaching Society that also publishes JME called Management Teaching Review. And so if you have a great exercise but can't collect data, Management Teaching Review could be another option for that as well. For JME, though, we require some evidence of effectiveness, in particular learning. The second section is the one that we probably receive the most uh, submissions to, and Jennifer can correct me if uh, I'm wrong on that, but it's the research component perception of the journal, uh, section of the journal. So whether it's empirical data, quantitative, qualitative, whether it's a theoretical type paper, a conceptual paper, a systematic literature review. I know some um, people in the meeting were discussing potential reviews and how to collate uh, what's known about a topic and whether that works for JME. Sure, absolutely. Systematic reviews are, are very welcome related to management education topics. And the important element of it is to go beyond description, like uh, what Jennifer was saying earlier, and really integrate those implications for management education specifically that come from it. So we're very open to all different types of research methods uh, that best respond to the question at hand. And the third section, there's another slide coming up with a few others, is essays. So here, readers are recognizing that there's perhaps issues that they've seen while teaching or interesting topics that they would like to elaborate on, provocative issues, positions that they would like to put forward. And it can even include first person commentary within it. And it's more elaborating on this issue and the importance of it with recommendations and suggestions going forward for management education. Our fourth section is instructional change in context. So in this section, the type of articles that are submitted would be ones that are describing the integration of a new active learning pedagogical method, an experiential learning approach or other active learning approaches that are being integrated into a classroom or a program where perhaps that um, type of activity wasn't used beforehand. Active pedagogical methods weren't used beforehand. So it's the process of integrating it into uh, that context, that institution, whatever it might be. And the idea is to describe the process and in so doing, provide inspiration to other people who are going to integrate it in a similar way into their classrooms. So it's about the change aspect. The technique itself doesn't have to be new. It could be something that's been used in other classrooms before, but not in the context in which you're writing about. And therefore, you're talking about the change of integrating it into your classroom. And our fifth and newest section is the interview section, where uh, it features engaging conversations with influential figures related to management education or people that have had interesting and unique experiences that we can learn from. And so the interview is really grounded in that discussion with the person that you're interviewing, but it nonetheless includes at the beginning of the interview uh, article context and, and a review of, of the key concepts and a commentary on the article at the end as well. So because it's a new section, we ask that anybody who's interested in submitting an interview paper send us a very short proposal by email beforehand just so we can confirm whether or not it's in line with the section in the journal before you go out and collect all of that data. It's obviously not a guarantee that the paper will go through during the review process, but it allows us to confirm that there's a, a good alignment with the focus of the journal beforehand. So um, we also wanted to indicate uh, to include a couple of slides related to some common pitfalls that help you as you're positioning your article kind of see where sometimes perhaps um, we've seen challenges occur, issues occur for authors in the past and avoid them as you're creating the article and, and describing it in the first place. So probably the most common issue that leads to the most desk rejections, unfortunately, at the journal are that the manuscript is outside the aims and scopes, scope of the Journal of Management Education. So as Jennifer mentioned, we're very focused on classroom level discussions, very focused. It has to have an education focus because of the journal. So it, sometimes we might receive manuscripts where the question is not related to management education. It's more higher education, more broadly, what institutions should do, perhaps, rather than the management education focus. Very interesting articles, but just not related to our aims and scope. So unfortunately, it would be able to go through our journal, but we would encourage the person to submit to a different journal that is more higher education focused in those moments. And sometimes we also receive um, 
manuscripts that are less related to education in general and therefore outside of the aims of scopes. Another common issue is that the manuscript is not sufficiently grounded in the current conversations related to the topic at hand in the management education literature. This absolutely does not mean that uh, literature from JME has to be included in the paper. It's rather that literature from the conversation more generally, whichever higher education journal um, you're drawing from, has to be uh, presented at the outset in order to show how it's contributing to that conversation, extending that conversation. Um, methods are very important, and regardless of the section, um, whether it's instructional innovations or a research paper, it's important for those um, methods to be clearly laid out and rigorous. In particular for instructional innovations, as I mentioned earlier, it's very important that the data presented on an exercise, an activity, uh, a new implementation within a pedagogical impl implementation within the course, um, really demonstrate learning versus just satisfaction with the activity. So that's a piece of advice we always want to give. And very important also to make sure that those implications for management education are grounded within the paper as well. Now, I think we don't have that much time coming up, so I'll just go very briefly into this slide so that we have more time for questions. The submission process um, is done through our website. It's a Scholar One submission systems, so you can find all the information on formatting guidelines and how to submit from the Journal of Management Education website. Um, after it goes through an initial review by Jennifer and myself um, and is able to go forward into the review process, then um, it's the standard review process that you would see with other journals, so that's where I won't spend too much information on there. But I would like to highlight that if you haven't signed up as a reviewer for the Journal of Management Education and you would like to, please feel free to create an account on our website. We're always very excited to have more reviewers come and help out with the journal. And uh, we're very, very grateful for all the time that people spend to help develop the ideas of others. Really a focus of JME is the developmental approach to feedback and helping authors develop their paper. And so we're, we're very grateful for all the time that people spend reviewing for us. In terms of some tips, uh, it does help to get a friendly review from someone that you know that works in the same area as you do. And you know, on social entrepreneurship, for example, to be able to give you a good insight on whether or not you're highlighting the gap in the, in the literature that you're responding to sufficiently and just get that friendly feedback from a colleague. That can be a great first step before submitting. Um, one other thing that I would mention here, actually there's two things that I'll mention here. <laughs> um, it's very important to anonymize completely the manuscript. And sometimes when we receive a paper whether it's an instructional innovation, research, any section of the journal, there'll be little hints as to where the data might have been collected. Maybe we mentioned a university or uh, a city in which the data were collected, but it becomes a little obvious where perhaps maybe it like narrows it down to just two or three universities. Or we talk about the name of a course in which we collected the data or developed it for, but that's something that somebody could Google and, and find and then narrow down what uh, the potential university of the authors is. So in those moments, we'll, we'll generally return the manuscript to the authors and just ask them to make those little changes to anonymize the manuscript more so it can go forward in the review process, but that slows down a paper from moving forward into the review process. So something to attend to beforehand, which, which then avoids us having to return it to you for those minor modifications. And creating a strong cover letter could also be a great way going forward to um, position your paper right off the bat. We do a very thorough read of all papers. It doesn't replace it, but it does help us highlight what that gap is and see the contribution right off the bat, which is very exciting for us. Jennifer mentioned earlier that we have office hours and different ways that we try to support the development of manuscripts at the journal. Um, we have a slide here with those. So we have some upcoming, uh, we, ha we have an upcoming call for papers that will be bent available on the website very soon related to the 50th anniversary of JME. It's not on the site yet, but it will be very, very soon. So something to check out because I think that that will be a very exciting special issue. Um, 
Our next office hours are February 22nd from 8 to 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the one office hour per month. We try to vary the time so that it helps uh, everybody have an opportunity to be able to come. This month it's 8 to 9 a.m., but we do switch it up a lot so that it allows people to come. We'll be having an online manuscript development workshop on April 21st. Uh, information is already, if I'm not mistaken, Jennifer can correct me, I think it's already posted on our social media sites, for example, our JME Facebook page. We're asking authors who are interested in participating in that workshop to send us a full paper for, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the date is March 17th for the deadline for submission of paper. We'll try to include as many as we can. We hope to include them all, but if, if too many get submitted, we might have to choose a, only some. The idea is that it will be uh, small developmental conversations with one or more associate editors or other members of the editorial team at the journal with just three or four papers. It's gonna be an online workshop, so each breakout room will really be small scale in terms of how many papers are there to allow everybody to discuss the papers in great depth and really hope, uh, help the papers uh, de develop and move forward towards submission. So if, you're, if you have a paper in mind or if you have one that's already written and you'd love to submit it for that workshop, we would love to see you there. That would be amazing. Um, and then there's some upcoming MOBTS conferences that are always very developmental as well that are um, coming up in June and July. The June one will be hybrid as well. It's in Jacksonville, Florida, and the international MOBTS will be in July in Scotland and in hybrid format as well. So I'll stop sharing the slides so that we can focus more on discussion now and see, are there any other questions that we can help with or new questions that came to mind? Yes, maybe um, there, were, there was a one content question and one maybe process publication question. One was about, okay, what scope does the educate what scope does the education consider maybe in journal a short-term entrepreneurial trainings with a reaction level responses entertained in this journal so short-term entrepreneurial trainings um, so i think it's a question around what type of education and training i pick up from you that we here we're looking at tertiary education you know management uh, learning space so not we're not looking at training practitioners or people in industry and but okay and that's that's my understanding but over to you <laughs> yes exactly it's um very much focused in the higher education domain but it can be a short-term training absolutely it could be for example an experiential exercise that's designed to accompany one meeting of a class on social entrepreneurship or any other type of course. So it doesn't have to be a long term pedagogical innovation that spans multiple classes it can be that, but it does have to be done in the context of higher education. Jennifer, would you um, want to add anything to that point? I, I think you've made the critical points. I do know that now people are doing compressed teaching modules, right? You know, doing a, a one week module or weekend intensive within a higher education context. That's something um, that we would say a short term entrepreneurial training and comparing those models or discussing dimensions of those models. That would be fine. But again, within the higher education context. Right, and then uh, the other question was about the process of uh, publication in the journal. The question was specifically about how long would it take to get the paper published after after acceptance. But I think while we will, we're at it, you could tell us on average um, how long would a, re a review round take. Or, so I don't have the numbers in front of me. Perhaps Jennifer would have them with her. Our goal is really for papers that move into the review process to get a first decision to the authors within 60 days. It doesn't always happen perfectly like that because it made so hard these days with COVID and there's, there's lots of things going on. 
but we really do try to get that first decision to the authors within 60 days. Um, from that point, it depends on how many rounds of review there are. So if it has to go back to the authors or not, usually there are a few rounds of review that go into the process. So I don't have the dates in front of me. Maybe Jennifer would have them for how long on average from submission to final decision, for example. When a paper is accepted, um, it usually moves pretty quickly from that point. There's the last typesetting issues that have to be done and submitted, and then you get a proof. But usually I, I find the SAGE production system to be pretty quickly once the paper is accepted but how long it can take for a paper to get to that point of acceptance is is variable based on how many review cycles there there are for that um jennifer do you by chance have numbers or more insights on no because it's so variable uh, right how many how many months it could take from that process yeah so for instance if you have a paper that comes in and it's really um addressing all the dimensions that we've had it has a strong literature review it, it might start at a, at a minor revision i could see a paper and we have papers like that um minor revisions are you know a 30-day uh turnaround for the authors so in in that situation it could be you know a six-month process but you know for other papers if they're doing two major revisions and then um, going through the final process with sage and uh, with us as editors we review every paper and um, there's always a minor revision with us as well so um, that you know that puts a, a that range quite uh, wide but i think the important thing for folks is once once things are accepted in the system it's in online first and so people have access to your work, whether it's bundled into an issue that that can, again, depending upon how much we have in our overall queue, that can take an additional amount of time until it's in a formal issue. But once we accept it, it it's, uh, you know, it's uh, displayed on our website, it's accessible, it's citable and, and all of that. And I think that that's important for folks who um, are early stage uh, researchers for their institutions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, then there is a question from Diana. Can I submit a paper on community training on a community training program that is being run at a at our entrepreneurship center in Uganda? So a university center for entrepreneurship running a community training program. Again, the the scope that's out of our scope because the target audience is not the the student population but it's the the community if students were involved in that training program that might be and it's part of their training and development that would pull it into our scope but if it's entirely focused on the the community needs then it's outside of our scope Okay. It sounds so, great. It sounds exciting. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and then there are other outlets for such for such interventions. But I think once again, maybe to help our our audience to visualize, you know, the 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 type of paper that we publish in JME, we're thinking about okay, university students and uh, business school students and the, the teaching and learning that. Uh, practices, practices we have with them around social entrepreneurship. They're not social entrepreneurs, they're not community members that get trained or incubated. And so um, kind of curriculum based, uh, you know, course degree program based education. Yeah, I don't know if I'm helping. <laughs> I hope I'm not missing out on any questions. I had a moment of panic there because um, Microsoft team told me your meeting is about to end in five minutes. And I, I thought, OK, surely we can go over. But I managed to, to change the end time. Uh, so we have a bit of time left. Right, so I'm a lecturer, uh, Rebecca. I'm a lecturer within a university business clinic. And I was wondering if, if a submission for instructional innovation could focus on both the impact on the student and the social enterprise we have worked with, 
or would it be specifically on the student's perspective? I, I would say, uh, oh, my mic is on. okay. I would say that, yes, you could include the, the data on the impact on the, the partner organizations and, and it, particularly if you're using a service learning methodology or community-based learning, that sounds like maybe you're doing project-based learning or consultation with the, the community organizations. Yes, yes, and yes. Um, we definitely have to have the student part, but I think that that's part of the overall learning equation because the, the value proposition, right, is the providing um, some type of, of resource for the, the organization itself. And um, I would, you know, again, this is just my assumption if it's a community based or service learning model that um, we would encourage you to have literature that's both from the management education side where we have literature on that kind of um, project based learning consultation based learning, as well as appropriate literature um, from the, the community and service based uh, conversations that are happening in other higher ed journals. Um, so that may be maybe on or maybe off, but um, but that data is it's acceptable to include. It just, um, I wouldn't position it as the lead. It's sort of a supplemental. That's great, thank you very much. Okay, any, I don't see new questions. Any, you know, we can buy some time with some final comments maybe from you, um, Melanie and, and Jennifer. Uh, also from my side, I saw a question in the registration about predatory, predatory journals. So um, the way I avoid them is to, well, in South Africa, we have a list that is published by the South African government with what they deem to be accredited journals. Um, so I scan that list. Unfortunately, some predatory, some journals turn out to be predatory later, and they are on that list for maybe a year. Um, I cross check that with, um, in this case here in the south, we also have a look at the ABDC list. It's the Australian um, Business School's uh, ranking. And also, of course, um, you know, by reading and talking and reading, you pick up which are the journals, even locally, that people publish in and that they don't have trouble with. But if you get an email, um, usually with no kind of branding whatsoever, but just very bland email and they just tell you that, you know, they've looked at your amazing work and maybe you, you barely have a master's degree. <laughs> they say your amazing work, your expertise, and they promise you to publish in, in one week, um, then you know that this cannot be a legitimate journal. Well, that would be my <laughs> contribution to that doubt which came up in your registrations. All right. Um, okay, um, um, Melanie, back to your slide on the manuscript development workshop. Um, Diana is asking when it will be and she would like to join it. Oh, we'd be so happy to have people join the workshop. Um, so we just posted the information about it. I think you can find the information on our JME Facebook site, but we might be adding it to our JME official site as well if we can uh, soon. So it will be online on April 21st. Let me actually open up the exact timing here. I have it on my computer. I'm so sorry that you can see me opening files as I look for it because I want to give you the exact date and time. OK, I have it. So it's April 21st online between 7 and 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The submission deadline is March 17th in the evening at Eastern Standard Time. And so we're asking interested authors to send us a full paper. It'll be shared with the organizing team and Author was, would need to be comfortable also with their papers being sh shared with the other workshop participants because when we're in those small breakout rooms, 
uh, it won't just be the discussant kind of giving feedback, but we're going to ask everybody who's in there, the three or four people who are in a breakout room to read everybody else's papers so that there can be a lot of feedback given and suggestions from everybody. So it'll be online. It's our very first one. We're hoping to make it an annual event. We're right. very excited so. about this new initiative and we're hoping that it helps a lot of authors and that there's a big response to it. And to email, I, I should have mentioned this also, to, to send us the papers, you can send it by email to Jen and myself. And then we'll be collating all the submissions and hopefully being able to include everybody's paper within the workshop. Okay. Um, I, can we post your emails in this chat? Could you post your emails yes. in this chat? Just in case. Absolutely. Thank you. And I think meantime, Jennifer me mentioned... Oh, I'm sorry, Alex, I cut you off. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. There is a delay. Uh, we have, we, we're having load shedding at the moment. I forgot about it, so there's no power and <laughs> possibly a delay. Yes. I was just going to mention that, as Jennifer said, we're very excited to always look at abstracts. We can't read full papers normally outside of the uh, manuscript development workshop situation, but um, we're always happy if authors want to send us their abstract in advance and just get a little bit of feedback as to whether JME is a good fit for them and it, it fits within the aims of scope and we'll try and get back to authors as quickly as possible with some feedback on that as well. I'll just say uh, that we will be out and about this year at a number of conferences. One conference that perhaps some of you might be at is the uh, Association of International Businesses International Conference that will be in Poland. If you are there, I will be there and I'd be happy to connect with folks at that um, in that setting. Uh, we'll also be at Academy of Management, which will be in Boston, which I know is, is quite far um, for most of you, but we will continue all our virtual uh, opportunities uh, through the Management and Organizational Behavior Teaching Society conferences. They have a hybrid element. We'll have our office hours so that people can still have access to uh, the experiences that you might have in a conference setting. Are there any other questions that we can help with before we go today? I'll just say it's really been a delight to be with everyone. Oh, there's Alex, he's back. Welcome back, <laughs> Alex. Sorry, I'm using my phone data now. <laughs> oh, my. It takes a while for, for everything to be to come back. I'm sorry about that. Um, I think you were all saying your goodbyes and thank you very much. Yes, I'm very grateful as well for your presence and for uh, telling us everything about your journal. I think it has spiked uh, quite a bit of interest today. And for those who are wondering, we will post this video and the slides on our website in the next week or so. So a website is the same one I posted on um, about earlier, ansys.org.za. Yes. So, right. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Some of you are going into the night, some of you are going into the evening, and some of you are just starting the day, so all the best. <laughs> and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you so much for this opportunity to meet with everybody today. We're so excited. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.